and welcome to Practical Talk Time. I'm Sandy Robel, your host, and this is being taped on February 8th, 2012, and February is the month where we have Valentine's Day and President's Day, and we have a special program called Love Cycles, but it will be um, with our guest, Elaine Kuzmeskis, and she's going to be doing Love Cycles about three presidential couples which we know. Uh, Abraham Lincoln and Mary Todd Lincoln, John F. Kennedy and Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy, and o uh, Barack and Michelle Obama. And before I introduce Elaine, I would just like to let you know that Elaine is a professional astrologer and also a professional counselor. She has written several books, and I just would like to show you some of them. We have here Connecticut Ghost. And um, this is the Good Spell, the uh, Opera House in East Haddam, Connecticut, on the cover. Um, we have The Making of a Medium. And on this one, we have Elaine's uh, picture right there. And we also have Seance 101, because Elaine is also a certified medium. And Soul Cycles, Astrology. 101 and today she's going to be talking about what makes marriages happy and compatible are they made in heaven um, is there a way of predicting or planning or, or is it destiny and Elaine welcome to the show we're very glad Thank to you. have you back again and this is the month when people are interested in presidents and love and relationships and marriage. Right, we have Valentine's Day and President's Day, so we'll talk about both. Yes, it may be March by the time it airs, but oh, that's all anyway. Right. I enjoy sharing with you. Mm -hmm. And um, can you tell us um, how you got into relationship astrology and what do you actually use? If a, not talking about the presidents per se, suppose a couple came to you, mm -hmm. what techniques would you use? Well, I do a lot of compatibility astrology, and what I usually do is I start with their horoscopes. A horoscope is a picture of the heavens at the time you were born. In astrology, we believe when you take your first breath, the stellar influence are imprinted upon you. And that acts like a hard drive. And then throughout life, as the planets change, uh, different events occur. So I would look at the individual charts, and then I like to do Sun, Moon, and Venus. The sun is your individual spark. The moon is your emotional nature. And of course, Venus is love. So if those are in good aspects, it usually is a very happy marriage. And you know what the most classical indication of a happy marriage is? Saturn. No, no. it is one person's sun on the other person's Venus. That means you just love that person. And that often indicates lasting happiness. And sometimes that could be where two people we might look at and say, we wouldn't think of them being together, no. and yet they seem to get along very well. And they're happy or, with each other. Yes. Yeah, with the sun conjuncts Venus often brings a lot of, of the love and appreciation. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have your sun conjunct somebody else's Mars, Sandy, what do you think is going to happen? Mars being the planet of aggression. I think it might be very volatile, but some people also live on that as well. could be very sexy, too. Mars is the planet of male energy. Right. So a lot of fireworks, but also a lot of passion, too. Well, I would also think of Mars conjunct Venus. Oh, that's very as, passionate. Yes, that's, yeah, that's very where passionate. I would... And that's a, often people with Mars conjunct Venus are never satisfied. They just have this quality where they're in love with love. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes why marriages don't last. You know, in psychology, there's a period when you're in love with love. You know how long it lasts? Three months? I don't know. No, two years. About oh, two, two years. years. <laughs> After that, the honeymoon is over. We have to look at reality. And I think that's why a lot of movie stars, after about two or three years, they move on because that feeling of, they call it limberance, of being in love is gone and reality is there. Now, do you think, what about an engagement? Do you think people should married before two years or wait at least two years well, or more? I think the traditional idea of a year's engagement is a good idea. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now, I did mention Saturn. We usually think of Saturn as restrictions and being bad, but I know people who have studied charts say Saturn is what keeps people together, that they have to work at it. Right. Sometimes Saturn will make you feel very responsible and have a very strong sense of duty to the other person, but not a lot of passion. Mm. We can't have both. I, well, you can, but Saturn <laughs> kind of makes you work, work, work. 
But I always say if you work, if you work hard enough, you get the reward at the end. Mm -hmm. Because I know when we start studying astrology, mm -hmm. we have what we consider the malefics and the benefics. And, right, absolutely. Uh, and Saturn is always thought as being bad, but it ne isn't necessarily bad. It's something we have to work for and appreciate. Right. And you know, a lot of this more to life than just passion. There's also family life. If your son is in good uh, relation with another person's moon, that often shows fertility and a love of family. If you're close to another person's Mercury, these are the people that are friends, uh, that like to hang out together. And that's a good aspect for friendship. Not necessarily romance, but friendship. We find also another classic aspect of happiness besides the Sun and Venus is the Sun and Jupiter. Because Jupiter always expands. And if you're, somebody's Jupiter is on your Sun, it makes you, they make you feel good. They make you feel happy. And you want to spend time around them. Now, if the opposite is true, if somebody's Saturn is on your sun, you feel very responsible and you worry about them a lot. Yes. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And if the sun is conjunct Uranus, the planet of change, you will find the relationship may be a life-changing one. Sometimes people will say, it didn't work out, but it changed my whole life. That's true. That, yeah, and that I'm not sorry with. about it. Yeah. yeah. It's from my own chart, I, I would say that's yeah. very, very true. And when the sun is on Neptune, the planet of beautiful illusions and idealism, it's very hard to see reality. You either see the person through rose-colored glasses, or you're apt to be deceived. It's, it's hard to really see. It's like, it's like seeing through a fog if somebody's Neptune's on your sun. Well, isn't it, it can be wonderful or it can be very difficult. Isn't it interesting when you're saying rose-colored glasses mm. and being deceived and February is Pisces ruled by Neptune. Right. And that's when we have Valentine's Day and think of romantic love. Absolutely. And we use the rose-colored colors, red, mm -hmm. and pink, right. and the rosy colors. So even in that way, unknowingly or mm -hmm. knowing, well, probably unconsciously, we've incorporated those colors in, into our holidays. Well, I always say the Venus colors are the pinks and the blues. And if somebody comes to my office and they have a strong Venus, either Libra rising or Taurus rising or the sun or moon in Libra or Taurus, I look to see what they're wearing. Inevitably, they have pink and blue on. That's their favorite colors. Now, another thing about sharing aspects is your Venus and Mars together is very passionate, but it can also indicate um, relationships with brothers and sisters. For example, Prince Charles and Prince Harry both share Venus sextile Mars, and they're good buddies. They're good friends. Mm -hmm. When um, people that have Venus and Jupiter like to travel together, and it is true, Venus and Saturn, they stay together, but it may be very serious, serious relationship. Venus and Uranus. Well, or do you also think maybe that they're married and they, maybe they have a business together? Right, and they see marriage as a business. Yes, now, I'm one of my favorite combinations for astrology is Venus and Uranus. Because Venus rules the public in many ways, and Uranus rules astrology. So those of you that have Venus trine Uranus or in good aspect often make excellent astrologers. Did you know that, Sandy? That one I didn't know. Absolutely. And Venus and Uranus, they love to fall in love. And they often um, have this shared aspect of, of enjoying life. They often have this feeling of life is fun. And a lot of people before the media, actors and actresses, have Venus trining Uranus. Which is I, would, I would think they would be humanitarians, too. Also humanitarians. Bringing in the Aquarius ruled by the Uranus. Sure. And speaking of Aquarius, do you realize we had three presidents that were ruled by the sign Aquarius? Aren't they often assassinated as well? Well, no, let me see. The, the first one, of course, was, Abra uh, was Abraham Lincoln, who was assassinated. He was born February 12th, 1809, in Kentucky. And then we had Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He, he also not, died in office. He died in office, but he was not assassinated. Right, yes. And, I guess I should have said died yeah. in and office. And then we had Ronald Reagan, who there was an assassinated initial attempt, but he did survive. And he had um, Joan Quigley as his astrologer. Absolutely. And you have to be inaugurated at 12 noon on January 20th. And I did go to a workshop she gave in Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, while he, well, I guess he was out of office already, but shortly right. thereafter. Right. And what she had done, the only thing she could do is where they take the oath of office, is that she put it on the opposite side. She tried to change it. To she change she the could vibration. just change the location, and I remember when uh, George Bush, the last one, 
uh, was having his inauguration. I heard it on the radio, and it was just a mention that he was being inaugurated in the same place as Ronald Reagan. Very smart. And he was on that 20-year cycle. Right. Those so I don't know if he had an astrologer right. or whatever, but I, I do remember hearing that. Right. There is this cycle of um, Saturn and Jupiter conjunct every 20 years that a president has died in office. And it's interesting, even though there was an assassination attempt on President Reagan, he did not die. And I've always credited Joe Quigley with that. Yes. Because she was very careful. She was a great friend to Nancy Reagan. And she would deliberately plan events that were public events very carefully so that President Reagan was not outside during the worst or the most malefic mm -hmm. aspects. She never gave his birth time out at the workshop I went to mm -hmm. in Alexandria, Virginia, or Arlington, Virginia, mm -hmm. it was one or the other. Yeah. Um, she did say that after he died, she would give it out. Now, whether she ever did or not, I'm not we'll sure. Have to check on that. But you know, I, I'm going to. But she did keep it right uh, secret. He was her client, and it was confidential. Of course, and. Um, now, if you look at the three Aquarian presidents, they completely changed the United States. When President Abraham Lincoln was in, we had the Civil War, and the slaves were freed. When Franklin and Delano Roosevelt was president, we had the New Deal and many new social programs, such as Social Security and some wonderful things uh, that helped the average person. And when President Ronald Reagan was in, we had the decentralization of government. Now, today we're talking about love cycles to get a little lighter, and I thought I would talk about three different presidential couples. Mm -hmm. And the first being, of course, Abraham Lincoln with his lovely wife, uh, Mary Todd Lincoln. And they were a classic example of opposites attract. Plato said many years ago, people either uh, are attracted to opposites or people that are alike. Birds of a feather flock together, but we also look for opposites for, to compensate our personality. Mm -hmm. And President Lincoln was rather aloof. He was kind of gangly. He wasn't too social. Uh, and he was kind of a country bumpkin lawyer. And he fell in love with this lovely Southern Belle who was very polished, very accomplished, and very interested in her material comforts. Lincoln could care less how he dressed. Sometimes he would just keep his notes in his top hat. He just was kind of uh, uh, very unusual in his appearance. Now, Lincoln, of course, as we've said, was an Aquarius. And Mary Todd Lincoln was actually a Leo. And Leos love to be the center of attention. Both fixed signs. Yes. And, and Leos love to be uh, in the social limelight. They love mm -hmm. art and creativity. And they were exact opposite. He was tall and thin and kind of shall we say, less than attractive and very much a person that didn't want attention. Mm -hmm. And Mary Todd Lincoln was a great family. They were both great family people, but Mary Todd Lincoln loved attention. She loved fashion. She loved family. And she was always a little volatile in her temper because she has her moon in the 12th house, and the moon is your emotions. And the 12th house often indicates a person who has a problem with emotions. And I think today we might have talked thought of her as a, a person that was bipolar, mm -hmm. somebody that was a little bit hyper in her uh, abilities. And what happened very often is she would go into these mercurial rages, had a terrible temper, and many, many flare-ups. And often what would happen is because she was so emotionally unstable and jealous of people that paid attention to President Lincoln, um, that she often uh, caused unnecessary problems for Lincoln. She also was a spendaholic. She loved to spend money, as Leos do. I always <laughs> say the most expensive wife in the Zodiac is a Leo wife. The second most expensive is an Aries wife, because the fire signs do love finery, and they like to spend. Now, Mary Todd Lincoln was 21 when she met uh, her future husband at a dance, um, and he was 30. He'd already been through one uh, love affair that didn't go very well. And their courtship was very rocky, probably because of her mood swings. And in fact, at one point, he broke it off. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he had just gotten his Saturn return at that right. point. And also, uh, President Lincoln was prone to melancholia or depression, um, as was Mary Todd Lincoln. They were married, though, on, 11, on November 4th, 1842. And they had their first son, Robert, was born nine months later. And family life was very important to both Lincolns. 
They were actually very indulgent parents. They let the children run amuck in the White House, have a wonderful time. Uh, and Mary Todd Lincoln did pretty good until her son Willie died in 1861, which mm -hmm. was, of course, a great tragedy. Uh, after that, she became quite unstable. In fact, at one point, President Lincoln put his arm around Mary, and he pointed to the insane asylum in the distance, and he said, he called her mother. Mother, if you don't get better, I'm afraid that's where we're going to have to send you. So it was a very, very sad time. Mm -hmm. And like many parents in grief, she turned to spiritualism and to mediums. And did you know, Sandy, they had several seances in the White House? I've heard that, yes. And absolutely. And it was a Hartford... Edson Hillary Clinton, I believe. Hillary, yeah. It was a Hartford medium that visited, the, uh, that visited the Lincolns. Her name was Nettie Colburn Maynard. That I didn't know. And this is very well documented. In 1890s, Nettie Colburn Maynard wrote a book called, Was Abraham Lincoln a Spiritualist? And she told about the seances. Uh -huh. Uh, when President Lincoln first met Nettie Coburn, before she became married, he looked at her and he said, Child, you have a gift that is singularly of God. In other words, he saw her as a very spiritual person. Mm -hmm. Now, she was a trance medium. Do you know what a trance medium is? No, I'd like you to explain it for a our audience. A trance medium is kind of interesting because they go into a deep trance and spirit takes over directly. And what happens while they're in this trance state, you can actually hear spirits speak in their own voice sometimes. And at one point, she had the ability to levitate. And the piano actually levitated in the White House to the point where several senators tried to jump on top of it to keep it down. Mm -hmm. But she was in trance, and her control or guide was what levitated the piano. And they had the senators there as well. Absolutely. And what happened, um, the several evidential seances, one in which... Uh, former senators came through to advise President Lincoln on the war. Because when the Civil War began, people thought it was going to be like a six-week affair. And they actually brought their picnic baskets and went down to the banks of the Potomac River to watch the war. Because oh. they felt very strongly it was only going to last six weeks, so they had to see what was happening. I can't imagine going on a picnic to watch a war. I can't either. And the troops, the Union troops, were ready to go home after a few months. And President Lincoln was told by spirit to go in person and talk to the troops and advise them how important this was. So mm -hmm. at the end, of, and they told him also something else that was very important, not to bring any of the senators with them, to go by himself, because there were several spies and working against him. And he did, and the soldiers literally carried this six-foot-two man on their shoulders, and the troops rallied. Uh, Spirit also came through during many of the battles, and at one time, one of the um, spirits came through and said, less talk, more action, to try to get uh, Lincoln to go forward with the war. Uh -huh. And the final thing that I find very touching from uh, Nettie Coburn Maynard's book was Abraham Lincoln, a Spiritualist, was that when the war was over, the spirits actually dictated parts of the Emancipation Proclamation. And they told President Lincoln not to exact a punishment, but rather to take a tone of being conciliatory, to bind up the nation's wounds. And I think that was a very wonderful thing. In fact, mm -hmm. parts of the Emancipation Proclamation actually came directly through spirit during one of her seances. Um, I can't believe we only have 10 minutes left. Oh, and we, we have two more couples. We oh, have yes. the Kennedys and the Obamas. I'd like to have you back to talk more about Lincoln and the Civil well, War and the spiritualism. I love that. That's fascinating. I didn't know all of that. Well, let's get on a bit. John F. Kennedy, of course, was a Gemini. Um, he had a very interesting combination, the eighth house of his son, Venus, and Jupiter. Eighth house, as you know, is the house of sex. And he was a very, very passionate man. And not only has it been documented in, in recent books that he had several mistresses, but I think that was part of his nature. And he was very secretive about it. The East House is the house of secrets. Now, he was a Gemini, and I think he and Jackie got along fairly well because she was a Leo. And Gemini is an air sign. Leo is a fire sign. And we say in astrology that air fans the flame. So that's considered to be good. Now, John F. Kennedy's moon was afflicted in bad aspect of Venus and Neptune. And you know, I think women were always going to be a bit of a problem in his life, starting with his mother. 
mm -hmm. and going on. His mother could be very critical at times. Um, we know also that Jacqueline Kennedy also came from a family that had a great deal of troubles. Her father, unfortunately, was an alcoholic. And I think that always made her feel very reluctant to divorce John F. Kennedy because she suffered as a result of her parents' divorce. And there was a story that his father gave her a million dollars for not divorcing. At one at time, time, I'm pretty sure she wanted a divorce when she found out. I mm -hmm. think, I don't know why she changed, but I do think the fact that she came from a dysfunctional family, she would be what we would call an adult child of an alcoholic. That This is very typical. They don't want a, their own children to suffer. They're very sensitive to mm -hmm. them. I think if John F. Kennedy had lived, I bet you dollars to donuts she would have divorced him when he got out of the White House. Really? I'm almost positive she would have. Uh -huh. Because Leos don't take much from anybody. You know that. Leos yes, are very yes. strong. But they also love their children. The king of the jungle. That's right. Now, the last one I'm going to do just quickly is, of course, President Obama. He, has, um, he is a Leo, since we're talking about Leos. And his son in Leo is in his seventh house of marriage partners which means that he's attracted to very strong women. And Michelle Obama is a Capricorn. As we know, Capricorns are a very strong sign. Uh, President Obama has his Venus in Cancer, the same as the United States chart, and that indicates a love of family. And interestingly enough, his ascendant is right on the United States moon, which also indicates that eventually, I think that he's going to overcome some of the adverse publicity that's been going on. Mm -hmm. So this is good as well. Uh, I'm not going to go into the other two, but I'd be happy to do it another time because I think it's important that we talk a little more about the uh, President Obama's chart. Okay. Uh, he was born in Hawaii. I definitely think he is a United States citizen. And the interesting thing about President Obama's chart is that he has Aquarius rising, so he's very likable. People really do like him. And he has his uh, uh, Venus in cancer, so his family life comes very important to him. But also he has his Mercury in Leo conjunct the sun by a wide conjunction. So he's a great orator. Yes. A wonderful public speaker. And that speaker. would also give him the intelligence. Intelligence, the right. conjunct sun, yes. Yeah. And, I, and of course he's a Harvard graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's just begun to shine. Uh, unfortunately, he has the same aspect that JFK does of afflictions in the eighth house. So he could die a violent death, um, just as JFK had that particular affliction in his chart. He has to be a little bit careful in that direction. Um, I don't foresee him dying by natural another causes. Another time I, I'll tell you about yeah. a vision that I had yeah, I'd love four to years ago. Did you really? Yeah. Um, we only have five minutes. I don't well, know. Well, sure, a tiny bit um, of it, but I'd love to hear it. Well, talking about a violent death, I was walking in my, not thinking about anything. Mm -hmm. I was just walking in the hallway from my bedroom to the kitchen I don't have a flat screen TV uh -huh. and suddenly like I'm just looking here I see this flat screen TV and there's an announcement that Air Force One has just crashed in the Pacific and it is in water so deep it, the airplane cannot be retrieved and now she will be president it didn't say who mm. it said she will be president of course um, he this was the early stages four years ago of the primaries. Right. And he wasn't even a forerunner at that time. Right. And I told some friends we were on our way down to, to Manhattan. I'm shortening the story up. But then I thought, well, this is all well and good because it turned out that Joe Biden is his vice president. And a few months later, the plane, I think it was Air France coming out of Brazil, crashed. And they couldn't get the plane out. It was in water that was too deep. Right. And that was after this vision. And now I've heard that there's been some talk that maybe Joe Biden wouldn't run mm -hmm. again. And, of course, Hillary Clinton said she will not be continuing as Secretary of State. So when you're saying a violent death, I'm, I'm just well, wondering, is it my imagination? I don't know why I had this crazy thing. And I can still see it so clearly that it showed the map. And, like, where Anchorage, Alaska is, it was like coming down that parallel line, right. that longitude, that it showed that's where the the plane crashed. Well, let's and I mean, it, ha it sounds right. like a long story, but it, the information came to me so quickly, mm -hmm. and it wasn't that I was sitting and meditating or dreaming. I was just literally walking in, in my house. Right. Well, I'm not a fatalist. Just like uh, President Reagan overcame the 20-year cycle, I think President Obama could, too. But he has to be careful. He has the sun squaring Neptune. He has to choose his friends carefully.
And he has to be a little bit careful with that Mars in the eighth house of um, violent death. But I, I do feel that his heart is in the right place. He is trying. He inherited a very, very difficult scenario when he came on. Yes. You know. So Anybody who had that, whoever was elected was going to have a very rough time. And he's a wonderful family person. So, of course, we wish him the very best. We do. Mm -hmm. But as if I were his astrologer, I would say be very careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, of course, we give specific times. And what about uh, Michelle Obama's chart? Uh, Michelle Obama is very interesting um, because she does have that Capricorn chart, which, which is very good. She's a good mate for him. She has her son in Capricorn, but she has her moon in Pisces, so she is a romantic. And doesn't she dress beautifully? Don't you love the colors? And fashion is very important to her. Some of the things, I'm not, you know. Yeah. And her Venus is in Pisces. You know, Venus is exalted in Pisces. Yes. I feel she really does love President Obama. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Uh, she does have uh, her uh, Mars in Aquarius, which is good for the country. I think she really is patriotic and sincere. Um, and I, I do feel that Sun in Capricorn makes her a very strong person. She gives her a lot of strength. Well, it's ruled by Saturn again, yeah. which yeah. would make her very responsible. Mm -hmm. Very definitely. And but you know, she's a little more shy than you realize, because the Moon in Pisces can be shy. I think that uh, being First Lady took a little bit of doing for her at first. Well, I had heard that she wasn't so crazy about him right. running for right. president, but I think. She seems to appear that she really loves being in the White House. Right, I think eventually she's really she enjoying did. it. Right, but I think she wanted very much to please her husband with her Venus in Pisces, and she really does want to make her family happy. She spends a lot of time with her daughters. She's a very good role model for the American women. I and like al her. And also think the sun in um, Capricorn, she's Earth sign, and right. she's got the garden there in the White right. House, de and, dealing with the Earth. And she gave up her career to really focus on uh, President Obama and her family. So this is what she shows very wonderful qualities. Um, Mars in Aquarius, because she could be a little bit outspoken at times. I think we're going to see more of that in the second yeah. administration if she gets And we'll in. have to have you back about more of this because yeah. guess what? Time is up. Oh, thank it's been a pleasure, Sandy. Thank you. Okay. And thank everyone for viewing Practical Talk Time. You can contact us at practicaltalktime at yahoo.com. Thank you for viewing.